Welcome to Grace Bible Baptist Church. We're glad to have you joining us online this morning. And I'm going to ask Lexi to come. She's going to lead us in a song first as we prepare our hearts for the service today. He breaks the power of sin and darkness. His love is mighty and so much stronger. The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder. The King of glory, the King above all kings. Yeah, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You lay down your life. That I will be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Who breaks, who brings the chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of glory. Who rules the nation? Who rules the nations? With truth and justice, who shines like the sun in all of its brilliance? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Yeah, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you will take my place. That you will bear my cross. You lay down your life. That I will be set free. Lexi. We're going to have a few announcements we'd like to share with you. If you're able to join us this morning at 1015, you were able to tune in for the Grace Kids Sunday School class. And feel free to join us on Facebook or on YouTube each Sunday morning at 1015 for the Grace Kids Sunday School class. Tonight we'll have our um, Sunday evening Bible study at 6 o'clock. You can join us um, on Zoom for that as we'll be going through our Bible study and having some discussion as we discuss some of the holy language and holy vocabulary of the Bible. Um, Wednesday night, we'll have our Bible study at 7 o'clock with our Zoom conference meeting for prayer meeting at 7.30. We just started last week a study on small groups, and we looked at um, the biblical question of, are small groups biblical? We answered that, and we're going to be going into some of the habits that make small groups more effective um, in the ministry. So if you'd like to Join us for that. We'd love to have you Wednesday night for Bible study and prayer meeting. The Ladies of Grace will be meeting Thursday night at 6.30, so continue to um, be faithful in that ministry. If you're part of that, I'm sure they would love to um, have you join in. This time, we'd also like to give you the opportunity to give. We do believe here at Grace Bible Baptist Church that giving is an act of worship, so we'd like to give you the opportunity to do that. You can do that online from where you're listening right now, or you can also... Um, Bring your tithes and offerings here to the church at the um, there we have a lock box on the front porch. There's a couple of few, a couple more announcements we'd like to make for this morning, but we've got a special guest that's going to help make these announcements. If you'll just wait just a minute, he'll join us in just a second. Good morning, Grace Bible Baptist Church. It's good to see you. You look wonderful. Got a few announcements for some of the recent contests. In the coloring contest, the winner for this week is, drum roll please, da, 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 Eliza H. Good job, Eliza. For the chocolate egg guessing contest, the winner is, Emma S. Good job, Emma. Good guessing. Be sure to be following on Facebook for the next coloring contest and the next guessing contest too. 
Tune in on Sunday morning to watch me and my friend Sonny at 10.15. Bye! All right, so there's Hoppy joining us for the morning service. Make some announcements. So thank you for that, Hoppy. We're going to have one more song before we move into this morning's message. A song called um, Oh Rejoice in the Lord by Ron Hamilton. God never moves without purpose or plan when trying his servants and molding a man. Give thanks to the Lord, though your testing seems long. In darkness he giveth a song. Oh, rejoice in the Lord, he makes no mistake. He knoweth the end of each path that I take. For when I am tried and purified, I shall come forth as gold. I could not see through the shadows ahead, so I looked at the cross of my Savior instead. I bowed to the will of the Master that day, then peace came and tears fled away. Oh, rejoice in the Lord, he makes no mistake. He knoweth the end of each path that I take. For when I am tried and purified, I shall come forth as gold. Now I can see testing comes from above. God strengthens his children and purges in love. My Father knows best, and I trust in his care. Through purging, more fruit I will bear. Oh, rejoice in the Lord, he makes no mistake. He knoweth the end of each path that I take. For when I am tried and purified, I shall come forth as gold. When I am tried and purified, I shall come forth as gold. Today we're going to be starting a new series, or a mini-series, if you will, for the next two or three weeks. And before we turn to the text, I just want to give a little bit of background information on what I'm hoping that we will see over the course of this series. This series is entitled The Right Ways and Wrong Ways to Isolate. This is something that I've been praying and fasting over a lot recently, as I'm sure a lot of you have as well, during the uncertainty in our days and times in which we're living right now. And there's a danger when in times of uncertainty and uneasiness to be motivated by fear rather than by facts. And we're going to touch on some of the very real challenges that are happening right now in our country. The emotional, the financial, and the physical challenges that many people are facing right now. But our focus, as it always should be, will be on the spiritual challenges during this time. I read a quote one time that was, attributed to Charles Spurgeon. And if you know anything about Spurgeon, he had so many powerful and amazing quotes um, that sometimes quotes get attributed to him um, that it's just hard to link back to him directly. And I haven't been able to find this quote itself to verify that he was the one who originally said it, but the quote is something along, along the lines of, no matter what trials we face, no matter what challenges we face, no matter what we go through, our greatest needs are always spiritual. And I believe that's true. I think we would all agree with the sentiment of that thought. So as we look at this topic of isolation, we're going to touch on some very real, some very relevant challenges that this presents. 
And I'm going to try to keep the focal point in Ephesus on what is most important, our spiritual needs and our spiritual growth during this time. I'm going to ask you to turn to Mark chapter 14. And once you've found Mark chapter 14, we will be reading verses 32 through 43. In Mark chapter 14, starting in verse 32, it says this. And they came to a place which was named Gethsemane. And he saith to his disciples, Sit ye here while I shall pray. And he taketh with him Peter and James and John, and began to be sore amazed and to be very heavy. And he saith unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here and watch. And he went forward a little and fell on the ground and prayed that, if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. Verse 36. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. And he cometh and findeth them sleeping, and saith unto Peter, Simon, sleepest thou? Couldst not thou watch one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. For the spirit truly is ready, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed, and spake the same words. And when he returned, he found them asleep again. For their eyes were heavy, neither, neither wist they what to answer him. And he cometh the third time, and saith unto them, Sleep on now, and take your rest. It is enough. The hour is come. Behold, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise up, let us go. He that betrayeth me is at hand. And immediately, while he yet spake, cometh Judas, one of the twelve. And, met, and with him a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priests and the scribes, and the elders. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you today seeking peace. We come to you today seeking refuge. We come to you today seeking strength. Lord, these times we're going through present so many different challenges. Emotionally, physically, mentally, financially, and of course spiritually. Lord, I pray that as we consider these thoughts today from your word, you'll give us the strength that we all need. I pray that you'll help us to grow stronger in our faith during this time of challenge. That through this time of isolation, that you would bring forth a purging that would bring forth much fruit in our individual lives. Father, I pray for those that are hurting, those who are having a very difficult time physically and emotionally right now. I lift them up to you. I pray for a healing touch that only you can provide on their lives. I pray for those that are struggling financially due to either being laid off or being having their hours cut back. I pray that you will meet their needs. I pray for those that are struggling spiritually. I pray for those that are having a really difficult time with not being able to meet together with their church family. You'll help them to develop a closer personal walk with you, even though we can't meet together corporately during this time. I pray you use this passage of scripture to strengthen all of us. As always, nobody needs to hear from me, but we all need to hear from you. Lord, I pray that you'll hide me behind the cross. People won't just be hearing my words today. They won't be just seeing me, Lord, but they'll be hearing from you. I pray that that will be true of myself as well. We pray all these things in the perfect, precious, and powerful name of Jesus. Amen. This is a passage of Scripture that is very difficult for us to read. When we think about this Speaking to Christians. Okay, this, this message, I'm, I'm glad if you're tuning in today and you're joining us, if this is your first time joining us today. But I'm going to be talking specifically to Christians today. This message is going to be for the believers in Christ. And if, if we're going to read this, this passage of Scripture, which we've been talking about the past couple weeks, it's important to read it in context. 
If we read this passage of scripture knowing what is happening here, having a full understanding of what is taking place in these few verses we just read, this should break our hearts. As Christians, as children of God, looking and knowing that our Savior is about to be betrayed, brutally crucified for our death, brutally crucified and put to death for our sins. This is a tough passage of Scripture. It breaks our heart. If we're honest, as believers, there are passages in the Bible that we run to, metaphorically speaking. There are passages that we turn to because the words that we read bring peace and they bring comfort to our souls. There, there are words that we know that we can flip to in, in the Bible and we know that they will calm our troubled hearts. There are passages that we know that we can flip to and we know that they will quiet our troubled spirit. But this is not one of those passages. This is a difficult passage. This is a hard passage. But in the book of 2 Timothy, Paul wrote that all scripture, even the ones that are difficult to read, even the ones that are difficult to think about and meditate on, all scripture are inspired by God. And they're profitable for us. Now this passage may be very difficult to read, it may be a difficult thing to allow our mind to focus on and really get into this text. But it's necessary for us. Just as Paul told Timothy, it's necessary for our, our own personal instruction in righteousness. We may not necessarily like to study this, but we need to study this story. I had a football coach when I was in high school who was an amazing man. He's the type of coach that if I had had sons, I would love my sons to play for. Uh, coach Wayne Carroll is a man that I admire and respect greatly. He was just recently inducted into the Section 5 Hall of Fame, and it's very much well-deserved. Not just for his coaching accolades, of which there are many, but of the impact that he's made on so many other young men, including myself. And coach Carroll was a man of few words. When I messed up in practice or a game, he never had to go on and on and yell and scream to get my attention. He was a man who had earned and commanded respect, so when he spoke, I listened. And he said so many things that as a 16 or 17-year-old kid, I didn't understand how blessed I was to be listening to him that back then. If I could go back in time, like back to the future or something like that, I would grab a notebook and write down all the things that he said. So I could look through them and be motivated and challenged by them now some 20 years later. But of all the things that Coach Carroll said, there are a few that have really stuck with me. And they've become some personal quotes that I try to live by. One of those quotes that he said was, don't tell me, show me. Now in those five words, he communicated that talk was cheap. Don't tell me how hard you're going to work. Don't tell me how great of a season you're going to have. Show me. Let your preparation and results speak for themselves. And the other two that stand out the most to me of the quotes that I do have written down in multiple notebooks and multiple areas at my, in my house are these. Excuses are the nails that built the house of failures. And then the second one, you don't have to like it. You just have to understand that it's good for you. Now, some of you know I played quarterback in high school, and I like to joke that my claim to fame in high school was that I handed off for the most yards in school history. But I remember Coach once talking to me because I didn't like working out. And coach was very um, very committed to having the players being healthy, to be in the weight room, to prevent against injuries. Now I work out every day. I've got a gym membership, and now that gyms are closed, I've got a little setup with dumbbells and a power rack and treadmill and elliptical and a nice little space to work out. But back then, like a lot of people, my decisions were based mostly on my own personal preference. And when, when Coach Carroll said that, it changed my perspective. It changed my perspective from focusing on what I enjoyed to what was actually best for me. So if you're listening right now, I know this isn't the happiest passage in the Bible. 
This might not be a passage that you particularly that you like to read or think about. But like I was told 20 years ago, you don't have to like it. You just have to know it's good for you. And as Christians say, as children of God, as believers, we need to understand there are some things in the Bible that we don't like to address that we need to address. There are some things that we, I fear a lot of Christians avoid discussing and as a result, they don't get the spiritual depth and knowledge and their maturity the way that they should. Not only is this a difficult passage to read, I can assure you this is a very difficult passage to preach. And it might not be for the reason that you're thinking. And the reason why I feel personally that there is a danger in trying to preach for the sole purpose of trying to be relevant. Because if we focus all of our time meeting together on what is going on in the world around us, we can often take the Bible out of context in order to make it relevant to what we are currently facing. So there's a danger, I personally believe, there's a danger in trying to make God's Word real and relevant because God's Word is always real and relevant. We don't have to try to be hip and new in order to bring God into the 21st century. God's already here. He doesn't change. His word is still profitable, even if there's parts of it that we would rather avoid. But while we don't want our focus to be on being relevant, we do want to look for practical applications of Scripture that are relevant to what we are going through. Most of you know that I'm a very structured person. I like to have a very detailed plan for everything. My day, I mean, yep, I, I was excited a couple weeks ago. I got a brand new planner. I could chart out my day hour by hour and into 15-minute increment sections if need be. I'm very structured with, with my meals. Just I have a, a meal plan. We know we're going to eat different days of the week. I like to be planning ahead. And I'm, the same goes for my sermon preparation. My sermon outlines, you probably know, tend to follow the same basic format. Um, for each point. First would be a proclamation, or what does the text say? Explanation, what does the text mean? Illustration, here's an illustration of that truth being discussed, and then application. How does this particular thought um, apply to our lives? So while I feel that there is a danger in letting what is happening in the world guide the direction of the preaching of God's word, there is a time to focus on the very real and relevant challenges that we're facing. And I believe that this is one of those times. I mentioned that this series is called The Right Ways and Wrong Ways to Isolate. And today's message is going to be really an analysis as we compare Jesus and Judas and both of their motivations and their responses to isolation. I know I've taken a lot of time to introduce today's message, but I want to be very careful and very clear. Because there's a tendency sometimes when I'm preaching on things that are very relevant and very timely to what's going on in our world, to sensationalize. Because people tend to respond to sensational thoughts. There's a reason the news media propagates and promotes certain stories and headlines. Because it draws attention. It creates conflict or arguments that people tune in to hear about. And this series is not an attempt to try to draw attention to what we're going through but rather how we should be responding biblically to what we're going through. In other words, the focus is not only on relevance, but on response. Now, if you notice here in our text, we see a few people mentioned. The first person we see is Jesus. In the very first verse that we read there, in verse 32, and the last thing that we see is Judas in the final verse. And we're going to look at both of these men as we discuss the right ways and the wrong ways to isolate. Now, obviously, with Jesus, he's going to be the example that we look at today for isolating the right way. Now, if you're taking notes, if you want to write down this reference, so if you're following along on, on GBBC online, we have the outline listed under the notes tab. And if you're watching us on YouTube, if you click on the show more button, the outline is there for you to follow along with. But if you want to write this reference down, Mark chapter 7, verse 37. In fact, if you want to turn over just a few pages, just a few pages prior into the book of Mark, chapter 7, verse 37, what it says in these verses about Jesus, it says that 
he do he hath done all things well. Now we saw a couple weeks ago when we see that word all in the Bible, it means what it says. All means all. Jesus did everything well. That verse in Mark chapter 7, verse 37 that we just read is specifically referring to Jesus' healing. But the healing was not the only thing that Jesus did well. He did all things well, including isolation. Our challenge to, con to consider today is how can we isolate well? How can we isolate the right way? So let's look at the first thing that we see that Jesus did in our text from today. And if you look back at verse 32, we see two really separate steps that Jesus took of isolation. In verse 32, we see Jesus depart from the large upper room from where he was meeting to the disciples, or meeting with the disciples. We see that back in verse 15. And in verse 32, we see him leaving and going to Gethsemane. Then in verse 33, we see that Jesus left the other disciples and took with him just Peter, James, and John with him. And now in verse 35, we see that Jesus went further and now is completely alone at this point where we find him in verse 35. In both, both verse 32 and again in verse 35, we see that when Jesus isolated, the first thing we see mentioned is that he prayed. In verse 32, Jesus said to his disciples, sit ye here while I shall pray. In verse 35, after leaving Peter, James, and John and going off by himself, it says that Jesus went forward and prayed. The first thing we see in each of these stages of isolation was the priority that Jesus placed on prayer. During a time when he was facing emotional and mental anguish, beyond anything we could ever imagine, Jesus' response, his reaction, was to pray. I want to ask you, again, speaking to Christians, Speaking to believers, during this time right now, when you might feel isolated from your family and your friends, when you might feel isolated from your church family, how's your prayer life? Let me ask that again. In the middle of this time of trial and challenge, with everything that's going on around us, how is your prayer life? personally, what is the priority that you're placing on prayer? And you have to answer that honestly. As we're going to see here, prayer is the ultimate thing that we need to do. It's the primary focus of why Jesus went away in the first place, to isolate himself, to get alone for the purpose of prayer. Are you doing that? Because we can look at the challenges that we're facing and focus only on the current crisis or we can focus on the current opportunity. Now, I understand that just because you may be home more now than ever does not mean that you have more time now than you ever have. I am keenly aware of that. I understand that personally. Even though I'm not going off to work at schools each day, I feel busier now than I've ever had before. Ministry-wise, it's so much more time-consuming and takes much more effort to be trying to do church the way we've been doing it than the way we're accustomed to actually meeting in person. Some of you may be home more, but there's more to do. Homeschooling your kids while trying to work from home. Or even if you're able to keep working remotely, there are financial challenges and shortcomings. There's anxiety and there's fear. But that shouldn't keep you from focusing on prayer. In fact, it should motivate you to be praying more consistently and more fervently than you ever have. In fact, if you look at our current situation. And your prayer life is not any noticeably different than it was before this. I would suggest that you are not isolating the right way. If you look at verse 35, we see that Jesus himself was overcome by grief. He was overcome by emotion. It says that he prayed that if it were possible, the hour would pass from him. What was Jesus praying about here in this passage? He was praying about his impending death. And we find him here in Gethsemane. In Luke chapter 22, verse 44, in the parallel account to Mark's, 
It says that when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed more earnestly, and that his sweat was as great drops of blood falling to the ground. In our current times, when you might feel overwhelmed by our current crisis, or what is happening in our world personally, is your current prayer life, is your prayer more fervent than it's ever been? If it's not, you're not isolating the right way. In time of crisis, in time of separation from his friends, in time of being isolated from those he cared about, Jesus prayed. I would ask you, what are you doing in your separation? And I would challenge you that no matter what you are doing, no matter what you're going through, whether your life is continuing mostly without any major challenges in your daily routine, or whether you feel like your world has just been shaken and turned upside down and you feel totally overwhelmed by the additional stresses and pressures and changes taking place, to follow the example that we have here from Jesus to pray. Don't use isolation as an excuse to keep you from praying. Use it as the reason, as we see here with Jesus, to become more fervent than ever. To pray more earnestly than ever. To pray more passionately than you ever have in your life. So the first step we see that isolating the right way is to pray. And next we see privilege. And I'll explain that as we go through this. But the second point is privilege. In verse 35, we see Jesus' prayer. We have his words recorded for us. And he said, Abba, Father... All things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou will. There's a few different things we see Jesus specifically pursuing during his time of isolation. And the first thing we see that him, we see find him pursuing through prayer is his heavenly Father. And we see Jesus' words here where he says, Abba, Father. And these words are not confined to only this passage. There are two other occurrences, both of them used by the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Romans and then again to the church at Galatia, where we see that term, Abba, Father. In Romans 8, 15, he says, For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Galatians 4, 6 says, And because ye are sons, God hath set forth the spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So we see here, not only is Jesus crying out, Abba, Father, but the Holy Spirit that lives within us also cries out those words, Abba, Father. And there are two main applications as we consider this term, Abba, Father. The first is very straightforward. We see, without question, in the New Testament church, that Christians use that term, Abba, in their prayers to God. That much is clear. We can tell that from this text here from Jesus, and then also repeated by Paul, and then as evidenced by the Holy Spirit, using those, those terminologies as well. But that begs the question, what does that term Abba mean? Because obviously you don't want to go throwing around words that you might not really know the meaning of. There's some danger in doing that. I read a story about a person who was staying in Spain for a semester abroad, I believe it was. And they were fixing up the place where they were renting and they were installing a new handrail. And this guy decided it would be a good opportunity for him to go to the hardware store and buy some varnish to kind of finish, you know, the, the handrail. So we looked up the word varnish in his Spanish-English dictionary and went up to the store. And when he got to the store, he asked for the clerk for a tin of varnish, and the clerk just starts laughing uncontrollably. And when the clerk finally composed herself, she asked him to see his dictionary and showed him that the word that he, that he had actually asked for a, word, a, a tin of vanish. He had mistakenly used the word vanish instead of varnish. So before we go off and just start willy-nilly praying Abba, Father, we need to make sure we really understand what that means. Now some Christian literature translates Abba to Daddy, suggesting a childlike, intimate term for Father. And that's fitting here in the context, and it's suitable within the context of which we're speaking about. But James Barr and a lot of other theologians have written um, extensively about this, this term, Abba, and James Barr wrote in the Journal of Theological Studies a dissertation simply entitled, Abba Isn't Daddy. Other theologians have pointed out that Abba, unlike Daddy, is used by adult children as well as young children. So it's not confined only to little children. In the Journal of Biblical Literature, Mary, 
Uh, Rose D'Angelo wrote an article entitled Abba Father, Imperial Theology, and pointed out that in Jesus' time, Abba was not a term of endearment. So we see here Jesus was not calling out Abba as he's calling out to Daddy or how a child would call out to their father in those closest, most intimate terms. So what does this mean? It's a term used by sons and daughters throughout their lives in a family context. And here's the key. D'Angelo said the usage of Abba suggests that Abba asserts not childlike relation to God, but the privileged status of the adult son and heir. The key term that we want to focus on here is the privileged status. Notice this. As Jesus faced the darkest, the most daunting of his many challenges here on earth, he pursued his heavenly father. He acknowledged the difficulty that he was facing. He recognized the reality and the gravity of the situation. But when he prayed to God, he remembered, get this, he remembered his privileged status. In the midst of being isolated and separated from the people and the places that bring us comfort. Don't forget your privileged status as a child of God. They might be able to limit how much you're able to go out in society. They might be able to restrict how much you're able to do right now. But they can't limit how much you pray. And they can't remove your privilege. In Jeremiah 31.3, God said, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. They say that when you're going through a tunnel, when it's hard to get your bearings, when it's hard to keep your focus, it's important to focus on the light, that light at the end of the tunnel. And while we're all going through this seemingly dark time, we need to remember to focus on the light, the amazing truth of the privilege that you have as being a child of God. In the midst of his trials and isolation, Jesus didn't forget about his privileged status. And you shouldn't either. We've seen two steps to isolating the right way, center on praying and also remembering our privileged status of being children of God. And next we see preparing. We're going to touch on a different aspect of this when we compare Jesus' actions here to Judas's. But in verse 38, we see these words from Jesus. Watch ye and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. The spirit truly is ready, but the flesh is weak. Once again, Jesus was in the midst of physical and emotional conflict, unlike anything we can ever imagine. But in the midst of his most arduous and trying times, we see him taking the time to encourage and to prepare those who we love. And Jesus points out a fact here that we can relate to and that we know to be true by our own personal experiences. He says, the spirit truly is ready, but the flesh is weak. Galatians 5.17 says, the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And it tells us that those two things are opposed to each other so they keep you from doing the things you know you should be doing. And when we go through times of isolation and separation, there's a feeling of disconnect. that keeps us from doing the things we ought to do, from things we would typically be doing under normal circumstances. Those spiritual desires and motivations can be replaced by fear. And we can become slaves to the moment and lose sight of what we should be focused on. And look how Jesus prepares his disciples here. Look back at that text. He says here, look, you're about to enter into temptation. These circumstances around my death, they're going to tempt you to stop doing things that spiritually you know you should be doing. In your heart, you know these things are important, but your flesh is weak. And so what does he tell them? Stay alert. Stay focused. How? Jesus says here, he says, watch and pray. That word watch means to stay awake to stay alert, to stand guard. And those are words that we need to attend to during these times of our own isolation. Stay focused on what you should be doing. Don't get sidetracked. Don't lose a sense of urgency that your spiritual walk should have. 
Stay awake. Don't fall asleep. Don't go into spiritual cruise control during this time of isolation. And that's extremely important and relevant as we go through these times. Doing churches, church services digitally and online are meant to enhance our live, in-person gathering. Digital church services were never intended to replace meeting together corporately. There are some things that we can't do meeting online that we can do when we meet together. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be as committed to engaging in what you can to stay awake spiritually as much as possible. I think we all realize by now that, for better or worse, this is church for the time being. So meeting together online, digitally, should be every bit as important and every much of, of and every mu as much of a priority as it is when we're able to meet together here in the church building. Stay awake. Stay focused. Stay alert. Jesus said, "Watch," which is extremely fitting in that. This is the way you can remain engaged and connected during this time of isolation is by watching through your phone, your computer, your tablet. He said, watch and pray. Pray and watch. And we see the emphasis once again that Jesus placed on prayer during the time of isolation. And I would ask you to once again ask yourself this question. What priority does prayer have in your life? The sad truth is that Jesus said that his house would be called the house of prayer. But there's very little prayer taking place in his supposed houses. I think it's less than 90% of churches in America that have any type of evening service. And of the ones that do, only a fraction of them meet for the purpose with an emphasis on prayer. For churches that do have prayer meeting, it's the lowest attended service of the week. Now there are some variables to consider. During the week, some people tend to be busier than they are on Sundays with work and school schedules and such. People just tend to be busier on weeknights. I, I understand that. I'm not disqualifying that by any means, but there's a truth that I think needs to be pointed out. If prayer meetings are the lowest attended meetings in churches, I think it shows very clearly that prayer isn't as important to a lot of Christians as it should be. Let me say that again. If prayer meetings are the lowest attended meetings in churches, I think it reveals that prayer isn't as important to a lot of Christians as it should be. And, and please understand. I, I hope you understand my heart. Those of you that are, who are part of our GDVC family, I think you all know this about me. I'm not someone who tries to be overly critical or condescending. I've never tried to beat people up about these types of things. Because ultimately, how you lead your family spiritually, how you lead your own life spiritually, is between you and the Lord. And to be completely honest, Wednesday nights tend to be the most stressful and chaotic nights in our house. And they have been ever since, truthfully, ever since we've had kids working all day and then rushing home to get the kids bathed and fed after school, um, trying to get them ready for church on Wednesday nights. I'll be honest, it's tough. It's chaotic. But Jess and I decided from the moment we had kids, it was worth it. And once again, I understand it throws off our schedule. Wednesday night is the one night of the week, every single week, where our kids are up way later than normal. Bedtime routine is completely different. But we decided that there are some things more important than sleep. Some things are more important than resting and taking it easy after work or school. In church, prayer, God's house was going to be more important to us than those things. In Jesus' words to his disciples, to prepare them for the coming attacks and temptations of the flesh, his words were, watch and pray. If you're being overwhelmed right now, if you feel like you are losing yourself emotionally, if you find yourself being flustered and, and frustrated constantly, I would ask you to consider how much of your life is devoted to prayer. If, you, if prayer is not the central key to your entire life, 
especially when things are going haywire and your life has no sustainability and, and, and no consistency, then you can't expect it to get any better without prayer. If, and the, the startling fact to me as a pastor is if we're going to read that in context, uh, over 90% of Christians, 90% of Christians never have the opportunity to specifically meet with other believers in God's house for the express purpose of prayer. Say, so how do you know that? Less than 10% of churches in America have any evening services at all. And of them, only a fraction of them even have any type of corporate prayer meeting. Any type of structured environment to facilitate prayer amongst the members and the family of Christ. A fraction of 10%. Say 3%. Think about that. 97 out of 100 people who live their entire lives, go through their entire spiritual life, without praying together with other believers unless it's a crisis. When something comes up and somebody's sick in the hospital, then they call somebody to come pray with them. I would state very strongly that that, that is not God's intention for us as believers individually or for the house of God. If God says that his house would be called the house of prayer, and prayer is what we see that was most important to Jesus in his communication with his Father, you can make the argument, and I will do it right now, that prayer meeting should be the highest attended service of the week, not the lowest. We saw the emphasis that Jesus placed on individual prayer in the text. But now we see a focus placed on prayer as a continuation. Continuing to stay spiritually connected and awake during this time of isolation. I love prayer meetings. Even now, even doing it differently through video conferencing. It's not the same as being here together. I'll be the first to tell you, it is absolutely not the same thing as being here together. But it's a great encouragement to see people's faces and hear their voices. And that act of meeting together, connecting together, praying together, Jesus said it's very necessary for us to avoid falling into temptation. If you find yourself feeling overwhelmed during this time of isolation, I ask, yourself, ask you to consider, have you prayed with anybody else during this time? Or have you been so overwhelmed by everything's going off, it's hard for you to get your own prayer time in, let alone to make time to pray with anybody else in your church family? You see, that's a priority here, as, as Jesus demonstrated. Now, let me ask you this. Do you think that Jesus was encouraged when he came back from praying? When he came back from pouring out his heart to God and lifted up his eyes to see what? His friends. His spiritual family. I think he was. Now, they weren't perfect. He had to keep reminding them to, to wake up and stay alert. But there's something encouraging in knowing that even though you're isolated, you're not deserted. You're not abandoned. And that's what watching and praying together offers. When you feel abandoned, when you feel neglected, when you feel alone, you look up and you see that you're not forgotten. You look up and see that you're missed. You look up and see that you're special. You look up and see that you're loved by God and by your church family. Some of you might feel like you are completely shut off. That nobody cares and nobody's concerned. And if you're feeling that way, please reach out to us. We have people that are literally on call waiting to reach out and help out in any way they can. We have some people that check in and say, hey, is there anybody that just needs to talk to somebody, somebody to pray with? Give them my number. Let them know I'm here. I'm available. But imagine this. Imagine feeling completely abandoned and look, then looking up to see that your friends are with you. That's what you can have. You can have your burdens lifted. You can have your heart encouraged. Jesus prepared his disciples to fight back against those temptations and trials by encouraging them to watch and pray. And that's what we need to do as well during our time of isolation. So we've seen the right ways to isolate and including the examples that Jesus gave with a focus on prayer, his privilege, and preparation. Now we're going to compare that with Judas and how he isolated in the wrong ways. If you look back to verse 10, we didn't read this passage of Scripture, but if you say there in Mark chapter 14, but turn back to verse 10, we see that Jesus, rather, we see that Judas departed and went off. And what we need to look at here is the people. 
than revolt. Verse 10, it says that Judas went into the chief priests. In John's account of this, he says that we see, Jesus or we see Judas rather departing in John chapter 13, verse 30. It says that Judas met, went out immediately, and it was night. So why does this matter? We look back at verse 10. We see who, Ju who Judas went out to meet with, the, the, unto the chief priest. Why does that matter? Because he went specifically to people who were opposed to God. These are people who would very shortly ha have Jesus um, executed and put to death. So how does that apply to us? Be very careful who you're spending time with and communicating with during this time of isolation. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33, it says, Be not deceived. Evil communication corrupts good manners. Be careful who you're engaging with at all times, but especially during times of isolation. It's important to make sure that you're communicating with people who are going to build you up and encourage you in your walk with Christ instead of Spending your time with people who are going to pull you away from him. We saw that in his time of isolation, Jesus was focusing on spending his time with God and those following God. But Judas spent his time with people who wanted nothing to do with God. So we see that Ju Judas was spending time with the wrong people. Next we see that he had the wrong purpose. As verse 10 continues, it says that Judas went to the, pre to the chief priests to betray Jesus. Judas' sole purpose in departing and leaving company with the other disciples was for his own personal gratification, his own gain. His stated purpose here, the reason he went off and distanced himself, it says, was to betray Jesus. Now, how does this directly relate to us? Hopefully it doesn't. But we see a warning here to make sure that our thoughts and motives remain pure during these times of isolation. I've been reading about, I'm, I'm sure you've heard of this as well, how a lot of companies have been using this time of crisis to do good. Different companies are offering things to help out during times of isolation. I know some fitness companies are offering free fitness videos and free memberships you can subscribe to online. They include digital workouts and nutrition planning. Some educational sites are offering free memberships for reading and educational activities. Even the site you might be watching us from right now, if you're watching us on GBBC online, this is a, a tool from, it's called Online Church Platform, which is offered freely from a church in Oklahoma City that just wants to be a blessing to help out other churches during this time of need. But for all these good and pure motives, there's some very negative motivations as well. By all accounts, alcohol sales are through the roofs during this time. One article that I read pointed out that many pornography sites are offering free access during this time. Church leadership outlets are warning churches to be prepared from, for when we do return from isolation. Because with alcohol and drug abuse leading to the increased domestic abuse that's taking place in homes. They're experiencing a huge spike in mental disorders, of depression, and anxiety. And more and more family and marriage counseling is going to be needed for, than ever due to this unlimited free pornography access. But Jesus, we saw that his responses to isolation drew him closer to God and led to a sense of protection and purpose for those that he loved. But Judas, his wrong responses led him to hanging around the wrong types of people who took him farther away from God. And his wrong purpose led him to doing things, not only betraying Jesus, but the guilt and shame of that action led him to take his own life. There's a lesson here that I don't want us to miss. The way that you isolate during this time will either bring you closer to Jesus or will take you farther away from him. There is no middle ground. This time of crisis, this time of isolation will either bring you closer to God or will take you farther away from him. 
we can focus on either the right things or the wrong things. You can be encouraged by the way you face this difficult time. Or once this is passed, you can look back and be ashamed of how you've lived during it. We see here today as we compare Jesus and Judas, there's a right way and a wrong way to isolate. With an emphasis on prayer, a focus on our privileged status rather than a focus on our problems. By taking steps to prepare for the continued difficulties and temptations that we are going to endure. By doing those things, we can isolate the right way. But if we spend this time in isolation, talking with and communicating with the wrong types of people, if we allow ourselves to get involved in activities that we know that we shouldn't, we'll look back with regret that we isolated the wrong way. I would encourage you, now more than ever, Spend time in prayer. If prayer is not a top priority and a commitment in your own personal life, make it one. If prayer meeting, if meeting with other brothers and sisters, if meeting with your church family, if designated times to pray together, to encourage each other, to bear one another's burdens, if that's not something you, you're actively involved in, I would encourage you to do that. If you're not taking steps to prepare, do that. Maybe you recognize the dangers that you already popping up in your life. Spending time communicating with or with the wrong types of people who are impacting your mind or impacting your speech, imp impacting your actions, impacting your spiritual walk in ways that are taking you closer or taking you farther away from God instead of closer to Him. I also uh, ask you to be honest about your habits right now. The habits you're allowing into your life and you're engaging in, if they're ones that are things you're going to be pleased with, or things that are going to bring you shame. Put those guardrails in place. And remember, let's, right, let's isolate the right ways, not the wrong ways. I want to thank you once again for joining us online today. If you're able to um, join us tonight for our, our Zoom Bible study at 6 o'clock, I would encourage you to do that. On Wednesday night, we'll have our um, prayer meeting and Bible study. At uh, 7 o'clock with a Bible study, prayer meeting at 730. Ladies of Grace will be meeting Thursday at 630. Thank you very much for tuning in today. God bless.